At the outset, I would like to, as always, offer my humble pranams at the lotus feet of our most beloved Bhagwan. Loving Sai Ram and greetings to all of you listeners and viewers out there. This is my 15th talk in this present series, which deals with the life and the message of our most beloved Swami. Last time, I discussed Swami's visits to Venkatagiri. Basically, I described how Swami used Venkatagiri to announce Himself to Vedic scholars. And this, I pointed out, was a prelude to making Prashantinilayam the epicenter for spreading ancient values in a modern context. Now the question can be asked and rightly so, could not have Swami done it without the help of those Vedic scholars in Venkatagiri? Of course he could have. But you see, Swami never acted that way. He always wanted people to be involved, which is understandable. After all, he had incarnated for you and me. So it does make sense for him to involve you and me. And he gave us plenty of opportunities, let me say. Now, in this context, allow me to recall what Swami said to a person. This person asked, Swami, when you can cure anyone with your vibhuti, why build a hospital? Swami smiled and replied, and his reply was very typical of him. He said, I am building a hospital just to show the world how to provide health care to those who cannot afford it. My curing people with Vibhuti is not the important point. The important point is you and the world must take care of those who are helpless. That is the real point. Okay, getting back to Swami's Venkatagiri connection. Let us remember that Swami always praised ancient tradition. That being the case, did it not make sense to give recognition and patronage to those who are already engaged in preserving the Vedic tradition? Swami knew that the forces of modernization would soon make the study of ancient scriptures and the observation of ancient traditions almost extinct. That was why he brought, so to say, a small sapling from Venkatagiri and planted it in Prashantinalayam. Now, looking back, one can see another subtle re reason for Swami going to Venkatagiri. You see, after the first visit, Swami made many visits to Venkatagiri. And as a result of that, the Raja and his family also began visiting Puttaparthi, in fact, much more frequently than Swami did. And in turn, the frequent visits of the Raja to Puttaparthi led to the Raja taking charge of the celebration of festivals held in Prashantinili. The Raja was very used to conducting big festivals in his own place. And he said, well, we must have festivals here also and I'll take charge. And when the Raja took charge, he brought with him a lot of organizational infrastructure. That in turn led to festivals being celebrated on a big scale here in Prashanti, which in turn increased the crowds coming to Puttaparthi. What I am trying to say, obviously not very effectively, is that behind all of Swami's actions, including seemingly small ones, there always was the grand design. Sometimes this grand design was visible, but more often than not, it was not quite evident. Swami clearly loved the Raja, for I have heard him talk about the Raja with great affection on many occasions. 
Swami told us once in Thrai that one of the great regrets of the Raja was that he was very tall. It's very nice to see a photo of Swami and the Raja. Swami is short and Raja is so tall. Now you might wonder, why on earth should a person regret being tall? Swami explained to us the reason. Back in those days, Swami said, I was often taken in a procession in a palanquin. This was an ancient tradition and a palanquin was usually carried by four bearers. Obviously, all the bearers had to be roughly of the same height. The Raja's height, on the other hand, was above average and that automatically disqualified him as a palanquin carrier. And for the Raja, this was always a matter of deep regret. Having been denied this privilege of carrying Swami's palanquin, the Raja adopted another way of showing his tremendous devotion to Swami. Swami used to say that whenever he left Venkatagiri after a visit, the Raja would lie on the road close to the car. Now what on earth for? He was a Raja and there he was lying on the road. This looked ridiculous. But obviously there was a reason. As Swami explained, back then the roads were not paved and they were mere mud roads. And that meant as, that car, as the car moved, it would kick up a lot of dust. And the Raja lay on the road because he wanted to be covered by the dust of Swami's car. Swami would add, just think about it. Here was a Raja. This Raja was the head of a princely state, a much respected man. And back then, respect went along with fear. Not that the Raja was a tyrant, but in a feudal society, which India was and by the way still continues to be, it was unthinkable for a Raja to do what this Raja did. And if he did so unabashedly, that was because his devotion for Swami was so great. Talking of the Venkatagiri family coming here and celebrating festivals, I cannot but narrate a particular incident that the Raja's eldest son spoke to me about. He did this in a radio interview that I recorded many, many years ago. The Raja's son said, those were the very early days of Prashanti Nilayam. And during festival days, Swami used to be taken in a procession in a palanquin. Now, preceding the palanquin would be drummers, Nada Suram players and singers, not just bhajan singers, but regular musicians singing in Carnatic music style. You might remember, I told you earlier that the Raja was a great patron of music. At that time, there were two leading musicians named Raman and Lakshmanan, patronized by the Raja. And they used to come along with the Raja and lead the singing during the processions. Now, what I am going to say might come as a surprise to you. But back then, there definitely was a certain measure of hostility among the locals to Swami. This animosity started almost from the time Swami came back from Morokonda in 1940 and devotees began to come in increasing number to Puttaparthi. Mrs. Vijay Kumari, who has documented the Patamandiram days, in her unforgettable book, Anyada Sharnam Nasti, makes explicit reference to this. By the way, please remember, I am now talking about the period 1945. I will come to the procession and all that, which was in the early 50s, a little later. Back then, in fact, this applied right up to 1950s. If one wanted to come to Puttaparthi, one had to first get by train to Penukonda railway station. That is the nearest railway station to Puttaparthi and it's about 25 or so kilometers from here. From the Penukonda station, one had to hire a horse-drawn cart known in these parts as a jatka. It was a single horse cart. I have traveled by jatka very often in the 30s and 40s. 
In Maharashtra, the horse-drawn carts were of a different designs and were known as tongas. I have gone by tongas too in Pune, which is now called Pune. That was back in the late 30s. In fact, those of you who have read the story of Shirdi Baba would have come across references to tonga. Now, getting back to what I was say, say, trying to say earlier, from Penukunda station, one had to take a jet car to go to the bus stand in Penukunda town. That was about a few kilometers away. There, one had to wait for as long as was necessary and take an old ramshackle bus to ride to Bukapat. Some buses went only up to Bukapatnam, while others apparently went a longer distance. Though the distance from Panikonda to Bukapatnam is only about 20 or 25 kilometers, in those days it would take hours to reach Bukapatnam. Now you might wonder why I am narrating all these details. Let me assure you it's for a very good reason, as you will presently see. Now, when you ride a bus, you obviously have to buy tickets. And when the conductor came to a family group and the head of the family asked for tickets to book a Patnam, the conversation would typically be as follows. Conductor, how many tickets? The father or the head of the family would then give the number of tickets he wanted. Conductor, going only up to book a Patnam or beyond? Father, we are getting down at book a Patnam and from there going to Puttaparthi. Conductor, what for? Puttaparthi is such a small village and there is nothing there. Well, we are going there to see Sai Baba. The conversation would end there, but believe it or not, many in the bus would immediately begin to abuse Swami as a fraud, how he was duping people, etc. This was the moment they heard that these people are going to Puttaparthi. To all of us, this, must, this might come as a shock. But the point I am trying to make is that where Swami was concerned, there always was some element of non-acceptance and hostility. In fact, Swami often used to say, especially in earlier times, that such hostility to the avatar was a part of divine design. And... Uh, I suppose it was divine design that made such hostility continue right to the end. Anyway, let me get back to the incident I was beginning to narrate. I was telling you about the Venkatagiri family taking Swami around the streets of Puttaparthi in processions. New Puttaparthi, I should perhaps say. Today, the ashram is surrounded by tall buildings and narrow streets that are full of shops, banks, internet cafes, apartments, etc., etc. Back in the 50s, mid-50s, which is the period I am talking about, I am not sure if there was even a perimeter wall around Swami's Mandir area, let alone buildings. Photos taken in that period, such as I have seen, hardly show anything. There were, however, some pathways and the procession would make its way going around the Mandir which was the tradition. When Swami went in procession, villagers would gather in the street in the, along the route to watch. While some stood with reverence waiting for the palanquin to pass by, others would wait with hostility. And when the palanquin carrying Swami passed by, these hostile people would pour out abuses and invectives. Normally, and this is what the Raja's son told me, Swami would simply ignore these insults, although some of the devotees in the procession would try to shout back. It seems, Swami would always tell the devotees right at the start to ignore such minor irritations and ask them to simply concentrate on the procession. But one day, the negativity was apparently too much, even for Swami. Swami then did something most unusual. He just leaned a bit out of the palanquin, looked at the hostile crowd and gave them a furious stare. The moment Swami stared angrily, the hostile crowd just ran away. The Raja's son told me, I am sure 
The look must have been as fiery as that of Lord Shiva in an angry mood. This was a tough crowd and not easily scared. But I am certain there was something really special and unusual about that look Swami gave. That is what the Raja's son told me. But you know what? The story does not end here. The procession, which was, was a slow-moving one, which was the general practice back then. After all, the distance they had to cover was rather small. And they went non-stop at walking pace, pace. At walking pace, the procession would be over in about 5 or 10 minutes. And that's really small. So, they used to stretch out the procession using music. And thus the progress of the procession would be in bursts or pulses. That is to say, the palanquin would be carried for about 10 paces and it would be rested on stills while the musicians played on, sang, Nadas from played on and so on. Afterwards, they would remove the stills, carry the palanquin for some more distance, again stop and move on. Stop, move, stop, move. And this was the way the procession progressed and it took a fair amount of time, 45 minutes to one hour. See, there was a purpose behind this. What was that purpose? By stopping in many places, the devotees had a chance to get good darshan. That was what happened on this particular day too. And that meant that the hostile crowd had a chance to launch a second attack. You remember the first time Swami started, they all ran away. But when the procession stopped again, they decided to have another go. And they did. But you know what? They were too scared to come back personally and hurl abuses as earlier. Instead, they drove a huge water buffalo into the crowd. Now imagine a huge buffalo suddenly charging into the crowd of children, women, etc. There was panic. And this precisely is where the story turns amazing. Mind you, I am merely narrating what the prince told me. And I am going to recall as best as my memory would, would allow what the prince or the eldest son of the Raja told me. He said, as we all panicked, one of the palace servants who was in the procession suddenly did something most incredible. The prince explained that when the Raja came, he brought with him a big crowd of servants, attendants, cooks, drivers, etc., to render assistance of various kinds while they were in Prashanti. Thus it was that there were attendants in the processions too. And one fellow among these attendants was just an, of normal build. He was not a very hefty sandal. There is a re reason why I am making a particular mention of all this. I asked the prince, Okay, so what did this fellow do? The prince replied, This fellow just lifted the buffalo and threw it back. I remember very well my reaction to this statement. I just couldn't believe it. I exclaimed in shock and wonder, What? You must be kidding. The prince replied, No, I am not. This fellow just picked up the buffalo and threw it back. I swallowed a bit and asked, not quite convinced of course, how on earth do you throw a huge buffalo back? I mean, how did this servant of yours pick up the buffalo in the first place? The prince replied, the man seized the horns of the buffalo and lifted it. That's all. I then said, now wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You say this man picked up this huge buffalo by the horns and simply flung it back? The prince replied, Yes, that's what I said. I replied, Listen, you are a cricket player. 
are you saying this man threw an entire huge buffalo like a fielder would pick up a ball and throw it back? Yes, that exactly is what he did. I was amazed and I asked, how far back did this fellow throw the buffalo? Oh, about 20 or 25 feet. And you personally saw all this? Why only me? All of us in the procession saw it. And so also did the mischief makers who were some distance away. What happened then? What happened? The mischief makers simply vanished and never came back. You know, you don't mess around with a group that is a buffalo thrower. It was as simple as that. Just believe all this. I said, okay, now let me get back to this fellow. How weak did you say he was? The prince replied, as I mentioned earlier, he was no huge Olympic muscular weightlifter. He was just an ordinary person of normal build. And you are telling me he threw a buffalo like one would throw a cricket ball? Yes. Where do you think this person got suddenly got the strength to do such thing? That should be obvious, said the prince. I then said, you know, the scene you are describing reminds me of a scene in the Ramayana where Wali kills the demon Dundubi, who had assumed the form of a giant buffalo. Wali then, Wali then picks up the carcass and flings it over a long distance. The prince replied, I know about that incident. I have also read it in the Ramayana. And you are telling me this puny servant of your royal household did a similar thing? Yes, I am saying that I actually saw a servant do a similar thing. And my belief is that for a brief moment, Swami transferred enormous power to this fellow to do something paranormal. And that event scared the hell out of the mischief makers. After this incident, the procession moved forward in a normal manner. Dear listeners and viewers, I have recalled my conversation with the Raja's son as best as I could. Some of you might be wondering, why on earth did I ask so many questions? Was it not crystal clear that all this was Swami's doing? Why then this disbelief? Let me say right away that I knew very well what Swami can do, as all of you out there also do. And we both know that not even a part, dust particle can move without God's will. But then you know there are skeptics out there always. That was why when I was de doing the radio interview, I asked hard and tough questions like a, a very tough anchor does these days on talk shows. And those questions led to detailed clarifications, as I just now recall. Thus it is that I am able to say with utmost confidence, Swami's power is limitless. But as he has himself declared on occasions, he seldom showed even a bare glimpse of it. True, on rare occasions, he did give brief glimpses. Most of this was done during the Pathamandram days and those displays were of course amazing as I recalled in earlier episodes. But then those were Swami's early days and the only way to make people take him seriously was via such spectacular miracles as we refer to them. Once he moved to the new Mandir, Prashanti Nilayam, spectacular miracles were no longer his calling card. Yes. He did give the occasional peek to spectacular miracles as we call them. And in fact, in later episodes, I shall mention a few of them. But by and large, Swami became mission oriented after 1950. Slowly and inevitably, these missions would soon become the core of my talks. At the same time, let me remind you once more that in whatever he did, Swami's main objective was to make people happy. All of us often use the word happiness, but very few of us really understand what it, what it really means. 
What is the meaning of true happiness? Do we understand that? I am afraid I don't believe everyone does. Now, the best way of appreciating what true happiness means is to consider the word pleasure. Ask anyone, including a schoolboy, what is the opposite of pleasure? Prompt would come the reply, pain. By contrast, true happiness, for which Swami always used the word ananda, it has no opposite. How come? You might ask. And the answer is that Ananda belongs to the transcendental and divine realm where there are no opposites. You see, here on earth, we have profit and loss, heat and cold, pleasure and pain, praise and abuse, etc., etc. In other words, the phenomenal world we live in, which is often referred to as Maya Prapanjam, in the, in the scriptures. It is the world of opposites. In the divine realm, on the other hand, there are simply no opposites. Thus it is that Ananda stands all alone. And remember what Swami used to say about happiness. He would say, happiness is union with God. What I am trying to say is that in whatever he did, Whatever. In some manner or the other, Swami always gave us a chance to experience Ananda. That might not be quite so evident in many of the things that Swami did. But as I go along, I shall try and highlight this aspect of Swami as best as I can. As Swami has said many times, He personally never wanted anything. I have heard him say on many occasions, I am not interested in my birthday or birthday celebrations. However, I know you people want those celebrations and I give you that opportunity. Not merely that, I also offer a lot of encouragement. Why? Because I want you to be happy. That happiness would make you love me more and come closer. And when you do so, the mere opportunity of experiencing more and more Ananda would help you to purify yourself and advance spiritually. That is what Swami used to say, by the way. I hope that puts in perspective what I said earlier. I have been talking about Swami, the Raja of Venkatagiri and his family. It is therefore appropriate that I end this episode with one more reference to the Venkatagiri family. In the Lord's avataric life, there are many characters. Most make brief appearances and then go away. They disappear. And it is given only to a few to play roles for long periods. It has always, always been so in all the avatars and the Sri Satyasai avatar was no different. Thus, after a while, Swami's trips to Venkatagiri completely stopped. The family, however, continued to come to Prashanti regularly. I have seen them here very often. And when the family members came, Swami, while giving darshan, would regularly stop near where the family was seated and speak a few kind words. Referring to this, the eldest son of the Raja, whom I interviewed, said to me, You know, back in the old days, Swami always used to call me Dornapata. For those of you who do not know, Dornapata means buffalo. And Swami always used it as an endearing term with young people with whom he was close. The Raja son continued, these days, Swami never calls me a Dornapata. No doubt Swami is very kind and affectionate, but I sure miss that form of address. I said to the prince, Sir, I understand what you are saying, but you know, Swami is also a stickler for protocol. After all, you are now the Raja's successor, and you are well past sixty. 
Surely you cannot expect Swami to call you Dhanapata in public. The Raja's, the Raja's eldest son nodded and replied, I understand what you say, but I still miss that old way in which Swami used to call me. Well, I think it's time I wind up the Venkatagiri part of the story of the Lord and move on to another topic. That I shall do next time. For now, I would like to take your leave and thank you for being with me today. I hope you enjoyed what you heard. God bless you all and Jai Sai Ram. As always, I would like to end this talk by offering it to Lord Almighty, that is to say, our most beloved Bhagavan. Jai Sai Ram.